Welcome back to MWO Sports here on CKNX Radio and Whiteman TV. Ryan Drury here will be joined by a great special guest, co-GM of the Walker and Hawks. Chum McCaskill will jump on to talk about the upcoming season and the Hawks' outlook as the PGHL gets ready to get started on October 1st. Then Sabby will jump on with me. Steve Sabrin and I will chat about the NFL opening kickoff. Can Tom Brady go back-to-back with the Bucks? How are the divisions going to shake out? And of course, we got to talk about the Blue Jays. They are rocking and rolling. And we'll relive our day at the Jays, the MWO sports crew, as we watch the Jays destroy my Oakland athletics. That's all coming up next year on MWO sports. This is MWO sports. Welcome back to MWO Sports here on CKNX Radio. Ryan Drury here, and I'm very pleased to be joined by another great special guest from the local junior hockey scene, the co-GM of the Walkerton Hawks, Chum McCaskill on the line. Chum, how you doing, my friend? I'm doing well. How about you, Ryan? I'm doing great because hockey's around the corner finally. Oh, yeah. What a relief. Finally. I can't wait. And uh, I know you're enthusiastic about it. I mean, how excited are you to just get back in the rink and see some great junior hockey? I'm, I'm excited. Uh, you know, we had our first skate last night. We had 20, 22 kids out. Sorry, wash here. Um, yeah, we had both 22 kids out and, uh, yeah, we're, we're excited to, to get going. Chum, I know that, you know, in recent years, obviously we saw a pretty sustained period of dominance from the Walkerton Hawks. And then over the last couple of years, you guys have went young. It's been a bit of a rebuild that you guys called it a retool, if you will. And then obviously we lose all of last year to COVID and the playoffs get cut short and everything like that. Um, Just how excited are you to kind of, you know, show everybody what sort of work you've been doing with the roster and just what can we expect out of the roster in terms of returning players potentially? Uh, In in terms of returning players, you know, we've, uh, we've made a couple of deals to, uh, to sell off a couple of our older guys to, to go younger. Um, It's still, Steve and I have that, the mindset, you know, a, a three year, four year plan. Um, that's still the progress. Uh, one, one kid that we've, uh, we've dealt, we've dealt, uh, Owen Torrey to the Hanover Barons, um, in return for probably, a, a stud defenseman in Derek Cornfield. Um, but in retrospect, we're going to, uh, Mount Forest is very, very interested in Derek and that's where he wants to play. And, uh, we're just we're just waiting to see what uh, comes available in Mount Forest to uh, to send Derek to Mount Forest. Yeah, I mean, I saw that trade the other day on Wednesday, Hanover posting about it, and obviously, yeah, you, you get a great player back, but obviously, you've got some flexibility in terms of potentially getting some other assets in. Just how difficult has it been in terms of working out the roster over the last year? And you know, as soon as we found out the season, it, you know, hockey's coming back, it kicks things into overdrive. Just how busy have you and Steve Barrett been trying to piece this all together? <laughs> I'll be honest. We uh, it's only been in the last probably two or three weeks that we've uh, we started to put our heads together to uh, to put a roster together for this year. You know, we we're we weren't we weren't sold that there was going to be a season, but the the PGHL has said that you know what they have a, a start date of October first, and that's uh, that's the goal. So you know what it's it's been kind of rushed to uh, to put a squad together. Um, Right now, we haven't put any names on paper signing. That's probably going to happen this weekend. We have another skate on Sunday. Um, yeah, and then we'll uh, we'll get to work. Now, just in terms of, of the rebuild, how, how valuable has it been to you guys to be able to tap into the local hockey pipeline? I mean, Walker to minor hockey, it's obviously a really big part of what you guys are doing. How important has that been in that relationship in terms of getting local players into the program? Um, Walker, Walker, minor hockey. We, you know, we, we, the last time we were on the ice, you know, we took, we took probably four or five kids out of Walker to minor hockey to, to play. Um, this year, you know, some of those kids have said, you know what, they're not, they're not interested in playing because of the mandate that the PJHL has of double vaccination. Um, it's, it's right now it's, it's tough to, 
tough to fill a roster right now, but you know what, we're going to, we're Steve and I are going to work very hard at uh, putting the best players that want to play for Walkerton on the ice. Now, Chum, I know you got to go. You're a busy guy, so I'll just ask you one last thing. Obviously, the coaching staff. Now, you had the benefit of having a guy in Brad Tiley who's got a ton of pro experience to guide the roster. Is the coaching staff going to be back? And if so, just how valuable is that to have with a young team? Brad will be back. Brad has indicated he's he's keen to keen to be back. Um, other than that, you know what, we're, we're actively looking for, for help. Um, the assistant coach that we had two years ago, my younger brother is not return is not returning. It's just, it was, it's a huge commitment. Bob lives, in, lives in Coburg and he was making the drive every weekend up here. And, uh, it's just, it was getting to be too much. So we're, uh, we're actively looking for hopefully a couple of local guys that, uh, have some interest in, in coaching and, uh, we'll go from there. That sounds good. But hey, like I said, having Brad back, I mean, he's such a well of experience and that's going to be great for some of the young kids that you bring into the Walker and Hawks. Exactly. Exactly. You know what? And Brad, Brad is, Brad's a good, good communicator with those, with the young guys. Um, and that's another reason why, you know what, we, we, we want to do this three, four year plan with, with younger guys and uh, get, get the kids to adjust to the way Brad wants them to play and uh, go from there. That sounds great. Well, Brad's always been good with us, and so have you and Steve. We yeah. always appreciate how available you guys are to us here at CKNX. And uh, Chum, like I said at the start, we're really excited to get back into the Walkerton Arena and bump into you guys. Uh, uh, best of luck throwing the roster together, and I can't wait to see you at the rink, man. You too, Ryan. Take care. All right, we'll take a quick break here on MWO Sports. When we come back, Steve Sabrin will jump on with me. Hey, we're recording this on NFL opening night. Tom Brady begins his quest to repeat as a champion in Tampa Bay. Can he do it? Will Dallas cause an upset? We'll talk about that and more here on MWO Sports. This is MWO Sports. Welcome back to MWO Sports here on CKNX Radio and, of course, with our friends on Whiteman as well. Remember, you can find us on our YouTube channel as well. Friday nights debuting at 9. We air Friday nights at 8, Sunday nights at 9 on Whiteman. 6 o'clock Friday nights on CKNX AM 920 CKNX.ca. Thanks to our friend Chum McCaskill, the co-GM of the Walker and Hawks, for joining me here earlier on the show. And Steve Sabrin joins me now. And Steve, I mean, uh, you know, as Chum said, we're excited. Excited to get back in the rinks. We're excited to finally see all these junior teams that we've uh, covered for a number of years back on the ice. And uh, the Walker and Hawks, you know, we've talked about it the last couple seasons after a period of sustained dominance in terms of regular season success, certainly anyway. They definitely took a step back the last couple of years, started a full scale rebuild, started going younger, and they're going to kind of continue that philosophy as well. But Brad Tiley coming back behind the bench. And uh, as I mentioned with Chum, that's obviously a huge advantage to them to have a guy like that leading the charge yeah you know what uh, great success at a number of levels and uh you know we saw um the tiley family do well of course his daughter shay uh part of that national pool as a goaltender so maybe we'll see her on the international stage for the canadian team in the future um and uh, alex of course winning uh a sutherland cup uh a few years ago um and it's going to be good. I think uh, Brad brings a lot of stability to the bench. Um, he knows his stuff. And, you know, it's going to be interesting to, to find out, is it harder to start from scratch on a new rebuild or kind of rebuild on your rebuild? Because, I mean, Walker didn't seem to be right in the middle of things um, and, and slowly climbing up the ladder. So it'll be interesting to see what they can bring to the table. On the other side, you know, it's a, uh, we've mentioned before, it's a fresh start. So, you know, you can go into the season um, with a little bit of confidence knowing that one team really hasn't carried over from last season with, uh, with a big roster. I uh, want to mention about the PGHL, Ryan. Uh, we have our broadcast schedule set on CKNX. Uh, we'll be excited to bring the uh, opening game of the season, Mitchell in King Carden on October the 1st. Uh, that'll be an 8.30 start for the Davidson Center. 
Um, and as we always try to do on OHA Hockey on CKNX is spread it around across the different communities. So we'll get a number of games featuring the Walkerton Hawks, uh, the Hanover Barons, Mount Forest, Wingham. Uh, but we're going to open up with Mitchell in King Carden on Friday, October the 1st. And the other thing, of course, uh, the Listville Cyclones getting back on the ice. And I'm excited to say that we will be carrying their home opener on Sunday, September the 26th against Caledon. Uh, note that Listowel is on the road on the Friday the 24th in Stratford, so that'll be a good game there. But we will be at the Steve Kerr Memorial on Sunday, September 26th for the 1.30 start as the Cyclones take on the Caledon Bombers, formerly Brampton Bombers, at Steve Kerr. So excited to bring you all of the action. Uh, we'll be with Listowel for 11 games in the regular season, plus their entire playoff run. Hoping it goes uh, a, a few series and the PGHL, of course, a number of games, and uh, we'll be we'll be back on the air soon. Yeah, it's exciting. We're excited to get back to work. It's going to be great. Um, and yeah, obviously a, a little bit of a, a flip on our end where we, of course, usually air Friday night games, but with list will be on the road that opening Friday, we'll shift over to the Sunday and that's going to be great. I can't wait to get back in the Steve Kerr. Speaking of the Steve Kerr, the Cyclones did put out uh, a release uh, as we record this. Uh, they have their COVID protocol out for all fans and uh, media members as well. Uh, and anyone else who will be attending the games, they're going to set the capacity at the Steve Kerr at 400 people. Uh, everybody will have to wear a mask the entire time that they're in the facility and maintain six feet of social distancing. As far as the blue line club is considered, they're going to have a max occupancy of 50 people up there. Uh, and immediately following the final horn of the game, everyone that's in the blue line club will have to, to vacate because of course post game that is where the team uh eats dinner and so everybody is going to have to be out of there uh, and have the team there just uh, with the space for themselves. Um, of course, you know, this is the Cyclones following the league mandate and, of course, uh, the provincial health mandate. So, um, you know, th th this isn't their fault or anything. You know, I would just say to anybody going to the games, you know, don't take it out on the volunteers and the staff and the majority of the staff in the, in junior hockey. Remember, folks, they are volunteers. A lot of them are volunteers, especially especially at the lower levels like junior B and junior C um, just be kind, be courteous to these people. They're just doing what they're told from the higher ups. Uh, but that is the COVID mandate for the cyclones. I'm excited to get back in there. We will definitely be among the 400 allowed uh, for 11 dates, as Steve said, and of course their entire playoff run. Yeah, uh, hopefully, I mean, things will get better as the season goes on, Ryan, but yeah, yeah. just want to reinforce that, you know, for those that can get there, you know, safety is in place and you can enjoy a live junior hockey game again. If you can't make it again, CKNX will have a call for you on certain dates. And we're happy to welcome PBJ Cleaning Depot Group, more than just cleaning supplies as our title sponsor this year. So thank you to those at PBJ Cleaning Depot Group, uh, ready to carry us through the season. And uh, we'll be uh, we'll be ringside for sure. Yeah, we're excited about that. Paul, and Bobby, Joe, and the entire crew over there. Uh, it's it's exciting that we've got a title sponsor and a lot of sponsors returning as well. Uh, a lot of names that'll sound familiar to our listeners over the years as well. We're really uh, thankful for PBJ and all of our sponsors, uh, obviously, because without them, we can't bring you the broadcasts. And I know a lot of people in the region enjoy them and we're excited to bring them back to you. Speaking of things returning, we're recording this on the kickoff of the NFL season. The uh, Super Bowl defending champion Tampa Bay Buccaneers with my boy Tom Brady uh, leading the charge, tr trying to become the first team to go back to back since Brady did that with the 03 and 04 Patriots, uh, a time of my life that I definitely look back on fondly. Three uh, three Super Bowl titles in four years for the Patriots back in those days. But they're taking on the Dallas Cowboys. And Steve, you'll remember I made a pretty bold prediction on uh, the Cowboys. I think that they can make the NFC Championship game. I'm going to stick by that. And I, I think mostly, Steve, it's just for the fact that I really like Dak Prescott. I think he's a tremendous guy. I felt awful for him last year. Of course, football fans will remember the gruesome leg injury 
I mean, that you know, the very first thing you think of was, you know, Theismann and, you know, worried about this guy's long-term career because he's an extremely talented player and, and Dallas needs this guy. I would love it just for him to be able to take this team there. And they've certainly got the offensive weapons. We'll see what Zeke Elliott's like. I mean, he's had some health concerns over the last year and a half as well, but uh, a great kickoff for the NFL season. And there's obviously going to be a number of storylines. We touched on it recently the Bills, you know, fighting for a new facility. Can the Chiefs get back to prominence? What are the Steelers going to look like? But uh, a pretty good opening night kickoff game uh, for the NFL as per usual, Steve. Well, you know what? It's going to be interesting in the NFC because if you look at the odds, uh, you look at the number of teams that are in the top 10. The Rams are up there in the top five. The 49ers are favored uh, to make it pretty far. You've got Seattle in the mix, a rejuvenated uh, Seahawks team. Um, I think the uh, the number of teams that are available to go deep is more in the NFC than there is the AFC. I think you can clear cut the AFC down to Kansas City, Buffalo for sure, and then you scatter a little bit of uh, maybe Baltimore, Cleveland in there. Uh, Tennessee, Tennessee, kind of Indianapolis might make some noise. Yeah. But if you know, you're to say today, who would you expect in the AFC championship? You could say KC and Buffalo pretty confidently uh, if they yeah. match up that way, depending on the standings. When you look at the NFC, it's pretty much wide open. Uh, Green Bay with Aaron Rodgers, despite the troubles in the offseason, you know, he, he, he's Aaron Rodgers. And when he steps on the field, everything just takes a back seat and he looks for the win. Um, you know, again, I mentioned uh, the Rams. I mentioned the 49ers. Uh, you'll probably see New Orleans drop off a little bit. Big piece of their team over a number of years. Drew Brees, of course, retiring. So it'll be interesting to see how New Orleans uh, uh, comes out this season. Um, but, you know, it's 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 exciting. And I still say, Ryan, you'll be buying that steak dinner by the end of the year when Dallas gets eliminated in the first round if they make it that far. Wow. Yeah, it, it, it'll be interesting for sure. I, I I agree with you on the AFC side of things. It Things feel a little bit more clear cut on, on that side of the ledger. The NFC... You know, there's going to be some bad teams there. Sure, you look at the likes of Atlanta, of course. Uh, not that the AFC has, you know, no bad teams, the Jets. But yeah, you, you look over there and you kind of, there are a lot of interesting storylines more so to me uh, on the NFC side. Uh, I mean, obviously people, our viewers can see I'm, I'm a diehard Patriots fan and I remain so despite Tom Brady leaving. I'm not that fair weather, guys. Uh, um that's an interesting thing to me. What does Mac Jones look like? Bill Belichick spent a lot of money on guys. Hunter Henry, of course, lots of defensive upgrades, Johnny Smith, but on the NFC, there's a lot of storylines. One I look at is the NFC West. You mentioned the 49ers, the Rams, and then you, you bring the Cardinals and the Seahawks into the mix. That's the division I'm looking at. That's going to be crazy because let's start with the 49ers. They went to the Super Bowl a couple of years ago. Obviously, they come up short. Then last year, they are riddled with injuries. I mean, Nick Bosa's out. I, Garoppolo gets hurt. A, a giant majority of, I don't think they had a single game, Steve, where all of their starting wide receivers and running backs played at the same time. Then, of course, George Kittle, who some would consider the best tight end in football. You can argue about Travis Kelsey, of course. He goes down for a majority of the year. Like, you turn around, they've named Jimmy their starting guy. Obviously, Trey Lance in the mix out of the draft. But, like, if they're healthy, a majority of that dominant defense is back. Could they go back? Kyle Shanahan has shown that he's a versatile head coach. He's going to be able to use his weapons. And if Kittle is healthy all year and guys like Raheem Mostert, that's giant for them. Could they be in the mix? Then you look at Seattle and you go, yeah, Russ is the defense little suspect. Yes, it is. But if Russ is cooking, DK Metcalf, Tyler Lockett, they've got Chris Carson, dominant offensive production there when they're rolling. 
the Cardinals are the team I'm looking at, and I'm actually going to put some money down on the Cardinals winning the division. I love Kyler Murray. He broke my heart as an Oakland A's fan, of course, because he's one of those crazy dual uh, sport athletes. He could have went into the MLB and was a first round pick of the Oakland A's as a pitcher, chose to go the NFL route because, of course, he can make a ton more money just going straight to the NFL. You pair him up with DeAndre Hopkins. They've got a great coaching staff there. They really upgraded their defense. Uh, Watt coming over. Is he going to be able to be healthy? I think they're going to make a ton of offensive noise. And then, of course, you know you can't forget the Rams. They trade for Matthew Stafford, who has shown to be a giant cannon arm. Now he's got a great offensive line arguably the best defense in the NFL. You can make a case for the Rams there with Aaron Donald, and he's got some great targets to throw to now. It's not just a one-dimensional offense anymore for Matt Stafford. He's going to have Cooper Cup, Robert Woods, and Tyler Higby to throw to. Boy, the Rams, they might have something to say. That NFC West division, Steve, I think it's going to be the most compelling one to watch. There's 32 teams in the NFL in the Super Bowl odds. In the top 14, the four West NFC West teams are in there. Arizona at number 14, Seattle at number 10. Then you got San Francisco at five, the Rams at three. And then when you look at the top three, Kansas City, Tampa, Buffalo. So, I mean, you know, it's it's going to be very interesting for sure. Uh, there's also some news, Ryan, out today that may have put Baltimore's uh, hopes uh, on the shelf. Cornerback Marcus Peters and running back Gus Edwards both suffer poten- potentially serious knee injuries at practice. Uh, and knee injuries can be very, very dangerous. Um, so until we get more word on what those actually are, I mean, for a cornerback and running back, I mean, those two positions cut a lot. And uh, that could put some strain on them, especially at the beginning of the season. Because if you lose you know, say three out of your first five games, you're in tough, uh, especially in the NFL, um, even though you've got the extra game this year. But we'll we'll have to see what happens uh, with Baltimore. But in the end, my money is still on the AFC to walk away this year with the, uh, with the Super Bowl. I agree because, I mean, even if uh, my quote-unquote Dallas Cowboys get there, I don't think that they could beat either of the Chiefs uh, or the Bills. Uh, And then, yeah, you look at the rest of the competition down the way in the AFC. Yeah, Baltimore is going to have something to say. But And you're right. I mean, losing Gus Edwards and Peters, I mean, Gus Edwards, I, I, I... it's funny the way things work out. I had my final fantasy draft last night. Uh, of course, our coworker Adam Bell was in this league, so he invited me to join in. I almost took Gus Edwards, and now I'm kind of glad I didn't. I hope he gets healthy, of course. But yeah, Baltimore, they're an interesting team. But yeah, you're right. You know, you drop a few games, especially in that division, like the AFC North, like Pittsburgh's not just going to go away. And I'm actually expecting a big bounce back from then. Like, yes, Big Ben's a year older. Is he in the greatest shape of all time? He never has been, uh, but he's still got weapons there. Juju Smith-Schuster, they've got Deontay Johnson, Chase Claypool, who really broke out last year. He had that four-touchdown game, uh, the Canadian, and uh, they've still got solid running options. And hey, you know, Mike Tomlin, he's one of the best coaches of all time. He's starting to stake his claim as one of the most consistent coaches ever. This team's going to bounce back. I mean, they're at least going to try to. And then Cleveland, like, what does Cleveland have? They, after years of misery and the dog pound, they showed up last year and actually proved, you know what? We're actually a pretty dangerous team and somewhat capable of playing consistently. Baker looked good last year. I'm expecting more from him, OBJ and Jarvis Landry. Like, yeah, this could do some serious damage with this uh, recent injury report to Baltimore's chances because. You know, you get you get outside of Mark Andrews and Hollywood Brown, who's inconsistent at best at catching the football. That doesn't leave Lamar an awful lot of options. He might be running a lot more than he's maybe ready for, Steve. Yeah, and the thing about Cleveland is the biggest thing uh, for them is their mental game. I mean, they have all the physical tools they need. I was actually lucky enough to catch Cleveland a couple seasons ago um, at the Dog Pound when they played Buffalo, 
And yeah, fantastic. Uh, they can eat you up on the ground. Uh, they have the quick strike capability. They can work the sidelines. It's all there. But for whatever reason, through the years, they crumble mentally and make um, you know that one mistake at a bad time that turns the tide. Uh, they seem to get rid of a lot of those uh, last season and were able to make some noise, but I'm sure they're going to want to go a little deeper. Uh, but I wouldn't be surprised if you see uh, them kind of move up the standings uh, from where they were last year. Uh, your Patriots um, is, you know, I think they made a great move in naming Mac Jones starting quarterback. They weren't going anywhere. Um, I mean, it almost reminds me of the, you know, the Tom Brady move is, okay, let's cut loose, start with our rookie and might as well get them into games because there's no there's no reason to sit there and waffle um, because you already know you've got you know several teams ahead of you uh, in in the standings. Buffalo's a powerhouse in your division. Um, so they're, yeah. they're expected to win, so why not go with the youngster and give him the time and you know get him experience back there? That's why you picked him to lead your team and might as well put him in there now. And if you look at the number of new quarterbacks coming into the league this season, uh, it's it's going to be pretty exciting to see this class kind of grow uh, grow through the system. And then, of course, you got that great veteran core and uh, Tom Brady, who's now the ancient one at the ripe old age of 44, uh, oldest quarterback in the NFL. Yeah, it's crazy. Uh, I like we're we're still waiting for Father Time to catch Tom. I, it's it's bizarre. Like he it, it 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 he could just he could just retire. He could just retire. It, it speaks to the level of how much he loves the game and how much preparation he's willing to put in to continue to be this excellent. And and really, you know, obviously everybody's read about how well he takes care of his body. This guy's eating avocado ice cream and all this nonsense. I mean, I think he drank tequila for the first time ever post Super Bowl there on the boat. He couldn't stand up at the Harbor in Tampa, but uh, yeah, he takes great care of himself. And Steve outside of that horrific knee injury in 2008, that took him out for the entire season. I'll never forget that the second snap of the season and uh, someone on Kansas city actually went low on his knee and destroyed destroyed his leg outside of that he hasn't had any significant injuries in his career that have hampered him now of course he had a significant knee surgery in the offseason played in the Super Bowl with a bit of a bothered knee uh but outside of that like this guy's kept himself incredibly healthy and he just keeps on wanting to win it's it's weird it, I think it'll be rare we, we might not see a guy win at this level in really any sport um, ever again in our lifetimes. And it, it's, it's been fun to watch, but you're right. Mac Jones, I'm interested to see, obviously he's got to shake that whole Alabama pro quarterback stigma because you look at Alabama quarterbacks, they come into the NFL and they really haven't done well. I mean, can Tua turn it around eventually? I almost still consider Tua a rookie because of his injury problems in Miami. Uh, he's going to be the starter of course. And then you look at all the other guys coming in, Trey Lance, Justin Fields, Trevor Lawrence, who will start for the Jacksonville Jaguars. That's another thing uh, that I'm interested in too, Steve. Another another storyline that's sticking out in the NFL. How good can Trevor Lawrence be out of the gate with Urban Meyer, a career college coach, a great college coach uh, behind the helm? Is it going to work in Jacksonville? We we We've seen these great college coaches. We saw Nick Saban try and do it come in chip kelly to a degree come in and try and have success at the nfl and it doesn't really translate i'm really really interested to see if jacksonville can get the wheels moving in the right direction down there because they do have talent on offense they do have talent for lawrence to throw to steve well i mean Pete carroll's done it jim harbaugh's yes. done it yep so i mean there has been success but not necessarily with a uh, quarterback freshly out of co uh, college um, so now, I mean, the, the, uh, the mental game, the capacity to communicate is probably on solid ground, former elite college coach, former elite college player, but both will have to step it up to reach the NFL level. 
Uh, and your comment about Mac Jones and shaking the stigma of the Crimson Tide is he has one thing that a lot of those other quarterbacks didn't have, and that's Bill Belichick. Yes. Right. So I yes. mean, there's a, a, a big, whether you agree with Bill Belichick or not, um, he seems to, you know, prune success and uh, it'll be interesting to see. I will make one more comment about Tom Brady, Ryan. And there is one thing that we definitely won't see anytime soon in our area, especially in Hollywood, where you can get some awesome ice cream cones is avocado ice cream. I'll stick with my chocolate chip cookie dough. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm I I I think I'll also stick with my mint chip and Rocky Road. Uh Tom, thank you. I like an avocado. I like ice cream. I don't think I'll be combining them, but hey, that's why I'm not a seven-time Super Bowl champion. That's right. All right, we'll take a quick break here when we come back. Of course, let's talk about the Blue Jays. We, of course, recently attended the Jays-Oakland game, the series finale. They choke slammed my Oakland A's into the baseball field. We'll talk about that in this great run the Jays are on, including the power of Robbie Ray and the tight pants on the mound. We'll talk about that next here on MWO Sports. This is MWO Sports. Welcome back to wrap things up here on MWO Sports here on CKNX Radio and of course Whiteman TV, Ryan Drury alongside Steve Sabrin. Savvy, let's talk about the Blue Jays. My God, we were you know, had Clark Clarkie on here. They're out of it. They're done. They lost a couple of games to Baltimore. No way they're making the playoffs. Well, they must have heard them because all of a sudden they put some anger into the bats and into the arms. Because as we record this, they're on a seven game win streak. They tore through my Oakland A's recently, and they're doing the same thing to the Yankees. As we record this, it's game four of that Yankee series. They're going for a sweep of the Bronx Bombers with Jose Barrios on the hill tonight as we record. Uh, Alec Manoa was great again, but then, of course, uh, we got to witness who, in my opinion, Steve, on that Sunday game when we went down the MWO crew to see the Jays in Oakland and they, they unfortunately beat up on my A's real, real bad. Eight nothing. They two hit them. We got to see. In my opinion, the AL Cy Young winner uh, now, it, it, just his performance down the stretch here, it cemented it for me ahead of Garrett Cole, ahead of Lance Lynn. Robbie Ray pitched a gem, 10 Ks. He one hit the Oakland A's who have some power bats in that lineup. And he became, I believe, the first pitcher in Jays history to have four straight outings with 10 plus Ks. He was unbelievable in that game. The fastball was electric. The slider was working for him. Like it was incredible. But overall, he's the central figure right now, along with some of the other arms, empowering the Jays along this incredible win streak. And they're right there in the wild card dance, Steve. Well, you know, it's interesting because in Wednesday night's game against the Yankees, uh, the Jays hitters held out for seven walks off the Yankees starter. And there were some comments from the broadcast booth there about pitchers seen today, teams are just okay with them throwing, you know, 95, 96, and then location, you know, we can work on later. And so they'll, they'll eat the walks and take the power. Uh, Robbie Ray is power controlled. His ability to master the strike zone with a 95 mile per hour pitch. And I think he hit 96 at least once when we watched, uh, you know, that grunt that you hear from 30 rows up uh, when he th when he throws the pitch in and just puts that more emphasis uh, into the throw. Um, you know, this is the first time all season that I think you can actually look at the Jays starting rotation and say, wow, that's a pretty good playoff starting rotation if they can get there. You've got three lefties who are awesome in Hyunjin Ryu, Robbie Ray, and Steven Matz. And then you've got the two righties sandwiched in. Not many teams can say, hey, we've got three lefties that we could throw at you at any time and they, they can get the job done. So, you know, that's fantastic. Not only that, but you're seeing Jay starters starting to go a little deep, uh, deeper into the uh, into the game. Robbie Ray went six and two thirds innings on the Sunday we watched against Oakland. Just couldn't get that last out. Uh, but that's huge uh, on your bullpen. If you can last, 
you know, deep into the sixth or even seven innings and only rely on your bullpen for six outs, that's massive. If you start getting knocked out in the fourth or the fifth, that's a long haul against really good hitting, uh, hitting teams. So, yeah, very excited uh, to see what the Jays pitchers are doing and, and coming together. Um, and, of course, we got to talk about the offense. They are just shredding the ball, attacking it. And you know what? The great thing is that, you know, Vladdy will take a single. He doesn't yeah. have to hit the bomb. So he'll hit a single, take the pitch that's given to him in a situation, and let the next guy hit. And they're hitting. Alejandro Kirk had three home runs and uh, I think six plate appearances going into Tuesday night's game. You know, he was on fire. He was slotted in as the DH for a couple of games. So um, the the Jays have options and, and you know, they're, they're doing the job. And it's interesting now because as of September, after the game, September the 8th, the Jays knocked the Yankees out of that first wild card spot. Boston held the first wild card spot. Yankees were number two. Jays a game and a half back of the Yankees going into the Thursday night game. So we'll have to see what happens down the stretch. You got to remember, they still have, I believe, six games. The Jays have six against Tampa. They've got three more against the Yankees. And then they have Minnesota and Baltimore uh, squeezed into their schedule to end the month of September. So it's going to come down to the wire. And let's just hope they can continue their excellence. Yeah, absolutely. Because you look at the teams involved with them, Seattle, my Oakland A's, of course, who mercifully have won two straight as we record this against the White Sox, proving they can actually beat a decent team. Uh, they're not going to slow down, but they've got tough schedules. Oakland, of course, you know, coming into September, the toughest schedule among teams in the playoff race. I mean, they are up against it. Uh, so the Jays, you're right. They need to keep winning and, and ideally mixed in there with Boston who now sit at 80 wins and snagged a couple off the Rays uh, off the back of Hunter Renfro's heroics the other day. They're not going anywhere either, but they've got those COVID worries. Of course, that's balanced out a little bit by Chris Sale coming back and looking like Chris Sale, uh, which is scary. But the Jays have got to keep it up, and and it might come down. Yes, they've got those games left against the Yankees, uh, one of which you're going to go attend, which is exciting. But those games against Minnesota and Baltimore, they might have to win all of them. They might have to win all of them, and they can do that. They're they're proving right now in this run, which hopefully continues tonight as we record this against the Yankees because I would love to see them miss the playoffs. If my Oakland A's can't go and there's one team that I would like to see also not go, it's the New York Yankees. Uh, but, yeah, they're proving that they can do this against really good teams and good pitchers. Uh, on you mentioned their hitting, Steve, in, in terms of some of the pitchers that they're seeing and doing damage against Garrett Cole. They lit him up the other night. If if they come down to the wire against Minnesota and Baltimore and stumble there, there's going to be some broken hearts in the four one six. Let me tell you that. Yeah, no, those are games that they have to go in with the mindset that they could determine their playoff fate. Um you know, win those, get those into the win column um, and worry about the Yankees later. Tampa Bay, that's going to be a tough haul. They've always had as a franchise a tough time with Tampa Bay. So if they can at least get a split with the race and kind of float and then go into Minnesota in high gear and, and take care of the Twins and then face the Yankees near the end of September, which could determine their wild card fate at that time. Um, and it hopefully the last series against Baltimore to end September, hopefully there's nothing on the line there. Um, but at least you might have a safety cushion and, and be able to uh, beat Baltimore to to end the season. Um, it's it's been exciting. Uh, and I know there's been a lot of talk between us about um, the Toronto Blue Jays stumbling at times, but you know, it was it was fun to watch when we went down and, you know, the pickups they made in the offseason. Uh, we talked to our friend Rodney Heemstra, former CKNX employee, and, of course, uh, now with the Jays organizations. And, you know, the talk about Marcus Semyon, not only his performance on the field, but Rodney's comment is probably one of the most professional 
athletes he's ever met in the way he prepares and works. And I think that's translated to the team and it's created an atmosphere, uh, an atmosphere of, Hey, if we put the work in, we can come out on top and Marcus Simeon making a name for himself for sure. And hopefully that leadership continues into the playoffs and they get Springer back. And uh, the nice thing is because the Jays are doing so well uh, in the last couple of games without Springer in the lineup, give Springer a little more time to to rest up and make sure he's 100% before stepping back on in the field. Well, that game that we attended, Semyon crushed a home run, and it was the only Jays run of the eight that I stood up and saluted for because, of course, part of my heart as an Oakland A's fan, and uh, you know that part of me was ripped out when he left. Uh, and, and you're right. This guy, it doesn't matter where he's been, starting off in Chicago and now coming over to Oakland, now the Jays here on this one-year $18 million deal, which is a steal based on the production that he has provided. $18 million is a thievery, and this guy is going to get paid. I mean, he's going to squeeze the juice out of someone's wallet. It's not going to be John Fisher's, I'll tell you that. But, you know, we, we talked a little bit at that game, just, you know, people seem to have a narrative right now. And I was listening to the Overdrive guys talking about this, too, the other day uh, with Steve Phillips. Where is this narrative coming from that it's just written in the stars that he has to not be a Blue Jay next year? Like, li- we've talked a bit about the roster and the shuffling that can go on here. And listen, I'm not in charge of, of this team's budget, but if this team is you know, has been selling fans this year on, look, we've signed these guys. We're bringing these guys in. We've got this young core. We're serious about winning. They showed that again at the deadline, getting Barrios. Um, If that is the case, why the hell can't they re-sign this guy and bring him back? Because look, you've got, uh, who was the pitcher that they ended up uh, DFAing that they tried to bring in the former national that started. I don't know why his name is escaping me that had the gas can ERA that they DFA'd. His money is coming off the books. That's about $12 million. You've got Randall Gritchick who makes ten and a half million dollars. Do they necessarily need him in this lineup? I don't think so. If if it means moving his ten and a half out to maybe bring in a cheaper bullpen option to bolster that bullpen and taking the rest of the majority of that money and giving it to Semyon, I do that in a heartbeat. He is settled in. If if you're married to Bo Bichette being your shortstop. Who better to have standing there at second base than Semyon, who turned into a great shortstop? Remember, a few years back, Marcus Semyon led the league in errors by shortstops, and he worked with the Oakland staff there, and it helped he had Matt Chapman there at third to help him. He rounded into a great defensive shortstop. He was also third in AL MVP voting in 2019. As I rattle all these off, I still can't believe John Fisher let this guy walk. It's an embarrassment. But why can't the Jays bring this guy back? They've got a lot of salary that they're going to be able to move off the books. They've got team control on Vladdy and Bo, so if they want, they can squeeze them and give them a quote-unquote bridge deal, if I can use a hockey term there. And, and pump some money into a three. He's going to be 31 years old. It's not like he's going to get a six or seven year deal, but why can't they give this guy three years at a hundred million dollars or something like that? I, I, I'm not buying it. Well, it, it's, it's very similar to what the Toronto Raptors went through with Kawhi Leonard, a great run. Now for Toronto, it ended up in a championship for the Jays yet to be seen where they end up. Uh, but again, a great run. But Marcus Simeon, as a player, is going to take advantage of the season that he's had and go to where he wants to go, and that's back to the West Coast. I can foresee him going to the Dodgers. Uh, That's really the team on the West Coast that has the coin. They'll have some uh, room for him on the field. Um, And it's it's funny, eh, right, because the teams who just keep throwing money out and getting guys like the Yankees, the Dodgers, uh, you could argue the Red Sox, um, but, uh, you know, as it, it's, it's the same situation. Um, he'll probably want to move on after, after this year, Toronto was a one year stop. And like, as a Jays fan, would I like to see him stay? Absolutely. 
But then the other thing, too, is there's no way Bachet and Vlad's agents are going to go for bridge deals. They're going to want they're going to want yeah. to lock in. And if you're if you know, you're looking at a business model at, for, uh, from the Toronto Blue Jays standpoint, they're the two guys that are going to take you down the road longer. Um, from, I, I agree. Right? I agree. And, and yeah, it's a good point by you. I mean, you can't sign a player if he doesn't want to stay right. And it won't be a, I hope Jays fans don't take it as like a sign of disrespect or anything, it, but it's similar to Kawhi in that sense that Semyon's an Oakland native. He's not coming back to Oakland, but he does have a strong desire and a, a, a rooted uh, interest. His family's still on the West coast. So it would make sense. And of course, uh, yeah, who else, but the Dodgers are going to pony up the money. It makes me sick. Uh, the economics of baseball are a, a little bit of a mess, but if that's the case, then and you're going to take that $18 million and let it walk. By God, they better re-sign Robbie Ray because we've talked about him. It was electric watching him destroy Oakland when we went on Sunday. This guy, he's the Cy Young Award winner. If the season ends right now, he's the Cy Young winner. And I don't see him slowing down in the next, what, what's he got left? Four starts, five starts, give or take. I don't see the guy slowing down. He's a K machine. And you think about the level that this guy was at when they acquired him. He was a walk machine. You look back at the Arizona days and couldn't figure it out. Always had good movement on his pitches. Just could not get them to land where he wanted. And just another feather in the cap, if you will, for Pete Walker. Look at the guys over the years that Pete Walker has turned into either for small stretches or very long stretches, dominant pitchers. Now he, look what he's doing with a young guy, his first year in the league in Manoa. Barrios has had a couple bumps in the road, but Pete's working with him. He'll figure it out. And Ryu, for the most part, in his time as a J, has been rock solid and worth every bit of money they paid him. So if you're not going to bring Semyon back, oh my, you better re-sign Robbie Ray. No, absolutely. And you're going to get more uh, out of that starting left-handed pitcher who possibly arguably could be your number one starter going into next season uh, with the performance he's had. Um, and, you know, again, no, no knock against Simeon. He'd love to have his bat in the lineup and his leadership, but there's several other guys that can possibly do the same thing. Vladdy's going to be a year older. Bichette's going to have another year under his belt. Biggio has yet to, to come back. Maybe he can start producing a little bit more. We've saw, have seen what Alejandro Kirk can do with the bat. So there's more opportunity to fill that spot than there would be your one or two pitcher coming on to the mound. Um, when you put side by side, losing Ray is more detrimental. And if you don't do everything you can as a club to resign him, then th that that's too bad. So, uh, you know, we'll see what happens and let's ride the wave right now while the getting's good. Um, I was watching some uh, former Blue Jays clips uh, after that win against the Yankees the other night, Wednesday, you know, turning back time a little bit, watching Joe Carter's home run in the 93 World Series, watching the Batista bat flip against the Rangers in game five of the ALDS you know, hopefully we can see some of that excitement uh, this season to uh, end, end the ball, the ball run come October. Absolutely. And Jays fans deserve it, man. We, hey, they've put up with a lot. Their team has not been at home in basically two years. They're finally back. They're on a run here. It would be very, very exciting for the country and baseball fans all over Canada, particularly here in Southern Ontario. If we could see some magical playoff moments, that would be amazing. And hey, they're in the fight now. They've got the swords out. They're ready to go. And it looks like that they've got their eyes set on one of those wild card spots. And that would be extremely exciting for everybody. All right. Wrapping up here. Uh, this is our second last MWO sports next week will be our final ever episode. Uh, it's been a fun run. Uh, Clarky will be on with us and we're going to drag some friends of the show on, of course, as well. It's going to be a lot of fun. So uh, next week we'll transition right into our junior hockey coverage. Uh, hopefully you can join us next week for the final MWO sports. Just before we go, Ryan, because Clarky's not here, I'm going to squeeze this in. Yes. Uh, Canada has quite a run going in CONCACAF World Cup qualifying. 
They <laughs> they tied the U.S. They, yeah. they beat El Salvador. They're currently sitting in a tie for second uh, in that final group stage play. Mexico's ahead of them. The hacks, yes. And so uh, October the 7th, they play in Mexico, which is going to be a huge game. If they can come out of there with a draw, uh, win would be awesome. But even a draw, if they come up with a draw, sets the stage really good for Canada down the stretch uh, for their national uh, soccer squad. Um, and so for all the soccer fans across Midwestern Ontario, there you go. Uh, go Canada, go on the international stage. Absolutely. And hey, let's quickly mention tennis as well. I wish we had more time. Leila Annie Fernandez and Felix Oje Aliassime were recording this on the night of the semifinals. Uh, as Leila Annie Fernandez tries to go to the U.S. Open final. Hey, it's a great time to be a sports fan in Canada right now, Steve. Great point by you. And hey, it would be awesome if they could get through the hex, the Canadian men's soccer team, and uh, go to a World Cup for the first time since 1986. Hey, that would be a nice change of pace. And you know what? I just uh, we got so lucky when we went to the Jays game when we talked about Canadiana because we saw uh, Warner throw up first pitch. The men's Damian Warner, that's Damian right, Warner, Olympic yeah. gold medalist, Olympic gold through the first pitch. And thanks to the Snowbirds for flying over the Rogers Center, that was a treat as well. I tell you, we had we had Canada all wrapped up on Sunday, and uh, it was pretty exciting. Yeah, wish uh, I could have used a little more California loving on that day, but uh, it just wasn't meant to be. All right, folks, uh, for myself, uh, Ryan Drury, for Steve Sabrin, and our guest this week, Chum McCaskill, we appreciate you listening to and watching MWO Sports. 